know, we know, uh, you know, the, the mechanisms have to be either the energy coming in or some changes in the atmosphere or some changes at the surface. Um, but the energy coming in, the sun is a well-behaved main sequence star. And we know how they behave. It is slowly getting brighter with time. Um, it was uh, four-tenths of a percent dimmer 65 million years ago, and that, because the Earth absorbs 238 watts, that means the forcing of about one watt per meter square. And the, sun, the sun slowly getting brighter by one watt. And the surface, the continents were located differently than they are now, but they were close to their present latitudes. And so the surf change due to surface uh, changes is also small. But CO2, 50 million years ago, was uh, about 1,000 parts per million. That is a forcing change from that to the amount of CO2 during the ice ages is a forcing of more than 10 watts per meter squared. So the dominant thing is the change in atmospheric carbon dioxide. That we, we expect that our carbon dioxide will change on long time scales because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere depends upon the balance between sources of CO2 and sinks of CO2. The source of CO2 is volcanic eruptions associated with continental drift. As a continent moves and subducts beneath it ocean crust, uh, the carbonates uh, in the ocean floor are metamorphized into basalt and other rocks and uh, there's uh, carbon dioxide emitted in that process which comes out in volcanoes and seltzer springs and such. But the sink, the primary sink is the weathering of uh, rocks. So the weathering will carry sediments down the rivers to the oceans and deposit on the ocean floor uh, carbonates, uh, which so that draws CO2 out of the atmosphere, that process. And also there's some deposition of organic material on the ocean floor, which then can eventually form uh, fossil fuels. But, uh, so what was happening here, 65 million years ago, India was still located south of the equator, but it was moving north at a rapid rate of about 20 centimeters per year. Uh, and as it was moving north, it was moving through this uh, so-called Tethys Ocean, which is now the Indian Ocean, but it, that ocean had long been the depot center for major rivers of the world, so it had a very young carbonaceous, the carbon-rich, uh, ocean sediments, ocean floor. So as India is plowing through there and subducting ocean floor, it's spewing up CO2 into the atmosphere. And uh, as CO2 increased, the temperature increased. And then 50 million years ago, India crashed into Asia. And that began to push up the Himalaya mountains and the Tibetan plateau. And so the source of CO2 in this uh, subduction is, is reduced and the sink is increased because of the weathering of the Himalaya mountains. And so CO2 gradually decreased and the temperature decreased until it hit, it became cool enough that Antarctica began to have ice on it and it suddenly froze over with the positive feedbacks. And uh, so there are two interesting things about this. The one is that if you look, if you look at the rates of these processes, the difference between the source and the sink is typically one ten thousandth of a part per million. Well, over a million years, that's a big change. A hundred parts of hundred ppm of CO two, which is a big forcing. But the human-made rate of change is two ppm per year. So we're more than ten thousand times more powerful than the natural. Uh, rate of change. So, you know, it's true. So the NASA administrator's right. Yeah, there are much bigger changes. But you don't have to worry about those because we're totally dominant now. Uh, those changes occur on a much slower time scale. And the other thing that's interesting is, well, how much CO2 was there at the time Antarctica began to freeze over? Well, in a paper that we publish next week, we show that it was about 450 parts per million. So 
the assumption energy companies and governments around the world assume that we can burn all the fossil fuels. If we do that, we'll end up with 600 or 800 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we will, have, we will be headed toward a different planet. The eventual, the eventual response of the system would be an ice-free planet with sea level 75 meters higher. So we really can't do that. Uh, and all, in fact, all the nations in the world, or 170 of them, agreed with this framework convention on climate change that said we should avoid dangerous human-made climate change. But nobody defined what that meant. What is dangerous? I think that the two most important metrics are extermination of species because that is irreversible on any uh, time scale that we can think about. Uh, there have been large global warming several times in the Earth's history, and when they did occur, there was extinction of more than half the species on the planet. And other species came into being over tens and hundreds of thousands of years. But on any time scale, we would leave a much more desolate planet for uh, young people and unborn uh, people if we cause the extinction of a large fraction of the species. An ice sheet disintegration, it takes tens of thousands of years for an ice sheet to build up by snowfall piling up. So we don't want the ice sheets to disintegrate. And there are also important regional climate changes. Um, and as I mentioned, there are tipping points which we need to avoid. Um, you, you can temporarily exceed a given level that would be dangerous on the long run, provided you get back to a safe level. If we suddenly had a thousand ppm of CO2 and we had that for one day, well, that's not going to cause ice sheets to disintegrate. You can have it for a while, but the question is how long? When do you reach a point of no return? Uh, and the process becomes dynamic and out of your control. Well, here's a process that we have probably pushed beyond the point of... We've pushed uh, to a point such that we're going to lose all the Arctic sea ice. Uh, this is the Arctic sea ice. From, it fluctuates from year to year, beginning in the late 1970s. And then last year, it, uh, but, it, but it's been decreasing as the planet has become warmer. And last year, it decreased to almost down to half of what it was a few decades ago. And uh, because the planet is now out of balance by about half a watt per meter squared, we're going to lose the rest of that Arctic sea ice in the summer. That's almost certain within the next few decades. But that is a reversible tipping point. Because if we would restore the planet's energy balance, or make it slightly negative, then the planet would cool down and, and the ice would go back. Uh, and it could go back in one year. Uh, but we would have to reduce CO2 to something like 300, 350 parts per million if we wanted the planet to uh, restore the sea ice. The more important issue with regard to ice sheet stability, uh, we can examine by looking at the area on Greenland that has summer melting. And that fluctuates with the weather. But it, the area in general has been increasing since we began to make satellite measurements in the late 1970s. And last year, the area with doubling with uh, melting was about double what it was in the 1970s, that melt water does not, in general, make it to the edge of the ice sheet. It will find a low spot on the ice sheet and burrow a hole to the base of the ice sheet. And it there serves as lubrication, which increases the rate at which these giant icebergs are discharged uh, to the ocean. Um, now, some contrarians argued that, well, the ice sheets will actually get bigger with global warming because you get more snowfall.